that if I try and rush through it all, I'm going to say things and they're going to go even more than they usually do. <laughs> and then I also realized something else that's important, which I don't think I've ever expressed to you all, but this is a very, very useful exercise for me to talk about these things. Because when I do research, it's very easy to read books and uh, you kind of read something that's abstract and you're like, yeah, it makes sense. And then if you ever have to explain it, you're like, yeah, it didn't make sense. <laughs> or, so you, or if you've got to be ready to answer questions, then you're like, I really don't understand that. Uh, it kind of made sense, but I don't understand it. So, uh, so in light of that and the fact that I kind of, uh, I want you to sort of understand where we're going. I'm going to take it slow, so we're going to keep going at a glacier pace, but we'll get through it at some point. So, uh, so in kind of a review of last time, um, we found that, what did we find? <coughs> yeah, so last time, we talked about taking a real manifold, which is locally even dimensional. So we talked a little bit about what manifolds are. They're these, in general, smooth spaces that locally look like flat space like the surface of the Earth. And when you have an even dimensional manifold, uh, locally you can give it the structure of complex space uh, with half the dimension, of half com uh, the complex dimension is half, just by pairing up coordinates into like x plus i, y pairs. Um, and uh, in the process of doing that, um, uh, we uh, introduce this thing called a complex structure, or an almost complex structure J, uh, which is basically a map that satisfies this relation, which if you, again, if you squint your eyes, it kind of looks like J squared equals minus one. So it's the sort of higher dimensional analog of multiplication by I. Um, but it's taking into account the fact that we have many different versions of the complex plane in this story. It's not just like one complex plane or, or one coordinate pair that's related by a uh, factor by. Um, and then uh, we found that um, we can uh, we can uh, we can take the Take the two n dimensional tangent space. So if you have a you know if you have some some manifold and you've given it coordinates, because everybody draws coordinates like that, uh, <laughs> then the tangent space at a point, say the origin, is just the space of vectors. You can take it to be the space of vectors tangent to the coordinates. And so usually whatever the dimension of the coordinates you need to describe points in the space, that is so to the dimension of the tangent space. And so that's why if we're in R2N, we have a two n dimensional tangent space. That's a real vector space, because the vectors in the tangent space, they, they follow vector addition rules with real coefficients. Um, but you can complexify it. Uh, and if you complexify it, then you create what we might call this. That's the the complex uh, tangent space to the manifold M. And that's, of course, now of dimension 4N. It's twice the dimension of this, because when you complexify something, you basically take any real quantity and you add on a second quantity that would be the imaginary, uh, the corresponding imaginary component. Okay? <coughs> and then, uh, Uh, but what we discovered is that we can, um, and I'm reviewing this in part because a lot of this particular language is going to play into a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, but with the almost complex structure J, uh, we can split this complex tangent space into um, eigenspaces. of J with eigenvalues plus or minus I. Uh, 
Okay, so let me just give you an idea of what that what the mechanics of that looks like. Because I said it last time, we kind of ended with it, but there's you know there's obviously a lot of detail to the story, and I feel like the detail is kind of uh, where some of this makes sense. So, so what we can say is the following: um, for x, an element of the tangent space of M. Okay, then um, then. Uh, what we can do is we can form uh, the set of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic tangent space elements by taking x and subtracting ij times x and x plus ij times x. Okay. So let's see if this gives us what we were hoping for here. Okay, so if I take an element of this and I apply j to it, I'm just going to pick a, an example of x, put it in this form, and then act on it with j. If I get this, then the first term just gives me jx, and the second term gives me what? So minus i times j squared. What's j squared? Negative one. J squared is negative one. For a second, it looks like that's the same thing as i times x minus i j x. Right? Everybody agree? Okay, so this particular combination of elements of x combined with i and j does in fact have, if I apply j, the eigenvalue plus i. An eigenvalue just means you act with something and you get back a whatever the eigenvalue was times the thing you acted on. And then you could probably easily convince yourself that the second set gives you eigenvalue minus i. Okay? Now, um, what that means is that uh, alternatively, we can think of uh, a projection. So we can think of the set of holomorphic tangent space elements as a projection of the full space where the projection operator that we use is 1 half 1 minus ij times x, where we can define this thing to be p minus. Okay. First of all, notice that uh, this thing right here is essentially this term. The factor of 1 half doesn't matter. It will matter for defining it as a projection, but in terms of what these elements are, you could always rescale the x's to produce or absorb factors of 1 half. Um, so let's first of all, look, so, so what do I mean by a projection operator for those of you who you probably, when do you first see projection operators in linear algebra? Quantum. Really? Quantum's the first time you see, you don't see projection operators in linear algebra? Maybe in linear algebra. Well, you do, you do, you just don't realize it. Like the dot product is a projection, you know, a projection of the first vector onto the second vector. So if you have two vectors and you consider you know, v dot w, one way to think about that is that you're taking v and you're taking the component of v along the w axis. So you're considering v as having two components, a vertical and a, and a, comp a, a component along w, a component orthogonal to w, and you're only keeping the part along w. So that's generally what a projection in a vector space is, is you, you have some arbitrary vector and then you're only asking what are the components along blank subspace where this is a this is a projection onto a one-dimensional subspace. You could imagine if you were in three dimensions and you had an arbitrary vector, you might ask what is its projection into the xy subspace? And that would be something in the xy plane. So you don't always have to project onto a single axis, you can project onto a plane or any subspace. Yeah. Um, when you say holomorphic, do you mean complex differentiable, differentiable, or? You weren't here last time, were you? I was not. <laughs> uh, what is holomorphic? Holomorphic means that, uh, actually, I'll, I'll come back. So for us, holomorphic is going to mean essentially uh, that it only depends on either uh, the 
uh, complex variables. Co holomorphic is only depending on the complex variables, and anti-holomorphic is only depending on the conjugates of the complex variables. We're going to refer to that in terms of transition functions in a minute in an explicit example, but you can promote it to uh, these tangent space identifications as well. Um, but I'm, I'm going to come back to an explicit example talking about that. Um, so what's the trademark feature of a projection operator? If you want to test whether something's a projection operator in quantum or wherever, what do you, what do, you do to it? Operate on itself. And what should you get? Zero. Or one. Wait, same thing. What is the famous it's equation self, that a projection self. operator satisfies? P squared equals P. Yes. So if I take this vector and I project it using P to get here, but then I take this and I project it with P, what should I get? I should get the same thing because it's already projected. So projection operators should always satisfy mm -hmm. that this operator squared is the, just the operator itself, which we can, of course, check, um, which you should always do. If I take P minus and square it, then I have 1 fourth, 1 minus ij minus ij, and then I get the square of this. i squared is minus 1, j squared. Holy shit. That is sweet. Okay. So this, is, this helps convince us that what we're doing is we're taking a large vector space and we're projecting it into a subspace. And it's probably not hard to convince you that this subspace is of the same dimension as this one. And what we're really doing is we're taking the space and we're breaking it into two pieces. Okay? And so we call those the holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic pieces. And then one can argue that there's a natural decomposition. into the holomorphic, the direct sum of the holomorphic and the anti-holomorphic <coughs> components of tangent space. So generally speaking, vectors live in tangent space, and I'm going to come back and repeat some of what I'm saying now in an example later. Uh, but vectors uh, live in tangent space. Uh, but now we can talk about, so we, uh, let me see if I've got some indices here to label this with. No, I don't, which is good because I can't contradict myself. Um, <laughs> vectors tend to live in tangent space, so maybe I'll have a tangent in the next mu. Um, and then what we can do is we can take the vectors and we can decompose them into parts which are, uh, and I'll call this like alpha is on the holomorphic part of tangent space, and then a component V beta bar, which is on the anti-holomorphic part. Of course, we could take a vector which only has a holomorphic part, so a vector which has no components in the anti-holomorphic part of tangent space, it only has a holomorphic part, and that would be called a holomorphic vector. In general, though, an arbitrary vector could have a bit of each. Okay. If we took an arbitrary vector, we could, of course, use the projection operators to project it onto its holomorphic and anti-holomorphic pieces. Um, okay. So, so that's all good. That's good stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, in addition to taking tangent space and breaking it up, we can do the same thing for cotangent space. And so we'll have a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic copy of cotangent space. <coughs> the importance of which is that vectors live in tangent space. So in our notation from general relativity, Anything with an upper x index lives on tangent space. Anything with a lower index lives on cotangent space, or what we call the dual vector. And then the nice thing is, is that you can talk about arbitrary tensors as having so many tangent space indices, so many co cotangent space indices, and all of these indices can be broken up into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic contributions. Okay. Um, all right. So... Uh, so I'm, I, I wrote some things down about the neon host tensor that, that Gabriel was asking about last time. Um, and I'm going to skip it for now, but we'll come back to it if we have time, which of course means we're not going to talk about it today. Um, <laughs> but I, I felt like I really wanted to kind of wrap my head around it. And it's really not that bad. Um, but, uh, but the reason I'm not going to talk about it is because we roughly have two different ways of talking about whether a manifold is, is complex or not. Um, so 
The idea that we talked about last time is that we have uh, the pair M and we have J, where J is an almost complex structure. Okay. And it's uh, just a 1-1 a, a one, one tensor, one upper, one lower end tensor uh, that satisfies this identity. Um, and then the question is, is can this be made into a, a, a true honest to God complex manifold? And you know what you know, what kind of problems would you run into? Well generally the problems that you run into when you when you want to make things into real into whole manifolds, starting from local definitions, is um, essentially tied up with the topology. And so uh, just, just to kind of give you an idea, this is not directly related, but I know like topology doesn't get really taught. You know, at the school very much, so I'm just going to give you some hints of what like topological arguments might look like. Um, so we know that in Rn, let's just say R2 for simplicity, where the tangent spaces are, the tangent spaces are copies of the space itself. They look identical, um, and they actually look the same everywhere. It is possible to have uh, vectors which are non-zero everywhere. So a, a vector field sounds like a fancy hoity-toity concept, but it's nothing more than what you studied in electromagnetism physics 200 when you say, what's the electric field, what's the magnetic field? Those are vector fields. Those are, it's a vector at each point space time. Or at each, at each point space. Uh, we can extend it, obviously, to vectors in space time. Um, but in R2, if I gave you a vector uh, field, then it is entirely possible for that vector field to be non-zero everywhere, right? I mean, you, we could, for example, just give it a constant value. Say it's something pointing like northeast and has a size of one. And then everywhere on this plane, you can draw that vector, okay? And that is a completely consistent, wonderful thing, and there's nothing weird about it. And then I can take another copy of R2, and I can do the same thing. But then um, we can think about a slightly more complicated space, and that is we can talk about a two-sphere. That is the surface of a two-dimensional ball. So just the surface, not the interior. And um, one of the ways of approaching the two-sphere is to think of it as locally something that looks kind of like R2, because we talked about how if you get on the sphere and let the radius get really big, or you just focus on a little neighborhood, it looks pretty much like R2, it looks flat. Um, so what we could do is we could take the two sphere and we could kind of draw a line around it, and we could just focus on the, this sort of top bit, the, the northern hemisphere, okay? And in the northern hemisphere, we've got something that roughly you know, it's kind of wrapped over the sphere, but it, it's roughly this, and so there's nothing that keeps us from doing what we did here. That is, we could draw these sort of constant vectors, and maybe they look like this in this space. So, you know, imagine taking this thing, and it's kind of a membrane, and we fold it over the S2. Okay, so we do this, and all the vectors do this wonderful thing. Um, and maybe this, maybe this is a little bigger. Okay, you already see something weird happening, okay? Uh, and then to complete the story of the S2, what we can do is we can grab this guy and we can wrap him around the bottom, okay? And what we can do is we can, we can kind of rotate him and wrap him around the bottom so the vectors are kind of lining up with what we've already got. And so we're gonna have vectors doing this. And in order to cover all of this space, we need to have this piece overlap just a little bit with this piece. So there'll be this like strip where they will overlap. They have to overlap because we have to cover all of this. And if you just put them edge to edge, you have to ask where's the point like right on the edge. Okay, so we just let them overlap and then we can point to something and say that is, uh, that's contained on both of them, so it's contained in the entire space. But now you all see the problem. Because even though here we can have a non-zero vector everywhere, and here we can have a non-zero vector everywhere, on the sphere you can't do it. Okay, and this is the Harry Sphere Theorem. It says if you had a Harry Sphere, someone handed you a Harry Sphere and gave you a comb and asked you comb all the hair flat, you couldn't do it. 
eventually you'll get to a cow lick that you can't. And you can see this immediately because these vectors are going around in a circle, but there's going to be some center to that circle. And at the center of that circle, like you can't say the vector points in some direction because all of these vectors have to match up. So the only, only thing that you can possibly do is say that the vectors go to zero at that circle, but that means that you can't have an everywhere non-zero vector field on the surface of a two-sphere. Okay. So, um, so the reason I bring up this example is because if you have something which is defined sort of locally, you're not always guaranteed that that definition will extend to a full space, especially when the space is topologically non-trivial, like a sphere. Okay? So there's usually some condition you have to check. All right? And it turns out that there are two ways to phrase the condition for when is a almost complex structure a complex structure. And that is, one, if the, I can't even spell it right. Oh, shit. No, me. God, I wrote it last time and I forgot. Do I have it here? Do I have it here? Damn it. Truly, you remember, Gabriel. You asked me so much about it. Was it Nien? Nien House? Something like that. Yeah, it's something. I can't remember the spelling. Uh, I feel like there's a J in there <laughs> that's not pronounced, but uh, I felt horrible. Like the, the guy that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just. Anyway, uh, if this tensor equals zero, then um, for reasons which I have written down, but we're not going to get into unless we have more time. Uh, if this Nienhoff tensor happens to vanish, then it turns out that you can consistently extend this to the entire space. But a second equivalent thing is to say if the transition functions on the overlap are holomorphic, then this almost complex structure J is promoted to a true complex structure and the manifold in question is truly complex. Okay. Any questions? Anybody follow that? Of course you did. No, no one would. Why would you? That's abstract and weird and so we're going to bang it into our understanding with some examples. Yes. So it's classified as almost complex if the tangent space is complex. You can locally take the tangent space and do this. The question of whether the almost complex... So you can define an almost complex structure on any even dimensional real manifold. Okay. The question is, is, does that almost complex structure become a fully complex structure over the entire manifold, rendering the entire space a complex space? Okay, so, so let's take this abstraction and let's actually look at some examples of complex manifolds because I feel like... These are all words, and we need to take these words and we need to see what they look like. Examples. So, um, and, and, and in these examples, uh, we'll actually, A, do some things which will prove very beneficial to those of you taking general relativity and might remind those of you who have already taken general relativity of lessons long forgotten. Uh, um, but, uh, Okay, so uh, obviously, obviously, n-dimensional complex space, n-dimensional comp the n-dimensional complex plane is a complex manifold. Okay, it's the simplest. It's completely uninteresting. It's infinite. You know, it's not compact. It's not topologically non-trivial. Uh, but it is an example of a complex manifold, and therefore it would, it would satisfy all of our definitions, but of course it satisfies them trivially because the, almost, the, the complex plane itself, just take C as an example, you know, where you have the usual X and I, Y, um, the tangent space to C at a point is isomorphic to C itself. And moreover, the tangent spaces between different points all look the same. And so you can actually cover the entire space with just a single region, what we call a chart. The sphere I covered with two charts. This I can cover with one chart. 
And so there are no transition functions to even worry about whether they're holomorphic or not. We could split it up and cover it with two charts, and then on the overlap we would find that the transition functions are, are trivially holomorphic, but we're just going to move on to a less trivial example to actually see this in action. Okay, so um, to get more interesting examples of complex spaces, uh, I'm actually going to take a detour and talk about a real space, which some of you might or might not have familiarity with. Um, but it's a non-trivial real space that has a natural generalization into a complex space, okay? So I want you to think about uh, what we call the real projective plane in n dimensions. How many of you have heard of the real projective plane? Awesome. How many of you have a bachelor's degrees in physics? I know. <laughs> No. You should see the real projective plane at some point. I don't know why you wouldn't. Okay, so here's the real projective plane in, in three different, three different uh, ways of thinking about the real projective plane. Um, it is the set of lines through the origin in R n plus 1. Okay, so let's, let's ask ourselves what this looks like. So let's, first of all, to be concrete, let's take an example. So I'm going to take R2 as the starting point. So we know what R2 looks like. That's just a good old uh, plane, which we can coordinatize by x and y, thus identifying the origin. And now, uh, let me just draw some lines to the origin. Okay, now buckle your seatbelts. This is where it gets hard. R2 is a space. It's a collection of points, and you can label each point by an ordered pair. It's a 2D space, okay? But I'm using that in this statement to define a different space. So you're going to have to kind of loosen up your idea of what a space is for a moment. And what I'm saying is that each of these lines is going to correspond to a point in the new space. So, you know, I could label these lines one, two, three. Of course, there's an infinite number of them, so this labeling is kind of stupid. But um, those would correspond to points in the new space. Now, quick question, reality check. Madison, mm -hmm. what is the dimensionality of this new space? R2. Any, any, is it one? It's one dimensional because your position in this new space is labeled by one number. That's where this is really weird. Okay, it's kind of a funny notion, but it's a perfectly well defined space. Um, okay, let me give you a second definition that might make you feel a little bit better. Okay, so a second definition um, is to consider r, the real projective plane, um, is equal to the n-sphere with identification of antipodal points. Okay, don't be scared, those are big words, but I'll tell you what they mean. So let's go back to our example. So this, this I would argue, would be a definition of rp1. Again, it's a one-dimensional space. We build it from a, from a two-dimensional space. So here, again, let's talk about RP1. This is going to be S1 with antipodal points identified. So let's do this. So S1 is just a circle. And we can draw the unit circle if we like. So that is S1. I'm drawing it in two dimensions to let you visualize it, but we certainly don't have to. It's a one-dimensional circle. And then what we're going to say is that if I pick a point on S1, and I call that point 1, I am, so, so the collection of points on S1 is what space? R1. The collection of points on S1 forms what space? R1. 
S1? Yes, it forms S1, exactly. So, <laughs> so I gotta do something to it to make another space. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I'm going to say that that point is actually the same as that point. I am not going to distinguish between those points. And similarly, this point is going to be identified with this point and so forth and so on around the circle. Okay? That's the identification of antipodal points. Okay? Now you immediately see that this is a different space than S1, right? Because for example, you lose half of S1. If you include this point, you basically go all the way to almost 180. But you don't go all the way to 180 because if you went to 180, you'd be right back there. If you think about it for a minute, this definition is actually the same as this definition. Okay. Again, it gives you a one-dimensional space, All right. but you, you sort of build it from something which is kind of sitting in a higher dimensional space. Now I'm going to give you a third definition, which is equivalent, Okay, but it's actually a definition which is going to give us a little more meat for the complex case. So let us suppose that we um, take uh, real n plus one dimensional space and remove the origin. Okay, so I'm thinking about the n plus one dimensional plane, but I'm gonna pull out the origin. I don't want that point included. Okay, for reasons you'll see in a moment. And then we want to quotient by a relation that says take x, y, z, dot, 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 however many coordinates I have in my n plus one dimensional space, and I want to set those equal to lambda x, y, z, dot, 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 for all real lambda. Let's think about that for a minute. So what it's saying is, if I start with the point one, 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 dot, 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 one's everywhere. Like I can, I can point to that point in the space. Like maybe it's right there, okay? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say that that point is the same as every constant multiple of that point. But that's exactly the line that goes through that point and the origin. It's the same definition. This is just a, a more formal way of defining this. Okay? The only trick though is we have to remove the origin from our starting point because otherwise this identification won't make any sense. Okay, so um, now what we're gonna do is a wonderful exercise which those of you in GR will really appreciate, and those of you who took GR will be like, nah, I can't remember that. We are going to prove that this space is a manifold. Okay, let's do that. So I want to prove that RPN defined this way is a manifold. Okay, and all of this I'm then going to be able to pivot and say, and then here's the complex version of it. So that's why we're spending so much time on the real version of it. So um, for those of you who don't remember, uh, the, the, the quick and dirty on proving something is a manifold. So if I have some space M, then I have to start by covering it with an atlas of charts, and that means basically I draw a bunch of these neighborhoods, and they can overlap with each other. And the idea is, and I can call these neighborhoods U alpha, and the idea is, is that M is the intersection to whatever, there's n of them, of all of the u-alphas. By the way, some, somebody on YouTube uh, made a, a huge correction to what I was talking about last week because I was referring to the overlap of two neighborhoods. If this is uh, u1 and u2, I was referring to the overlap as u1 union u2, which all of you let me get away with, <laughs> and that's horrible. u1 union u2 is literally this whole space 
and this whole space together. So it's this entire thing. I was talking about the intersection of those two spaces. So thank you to whatever YouTube viewer it was that pointed that out, which led to an interesting discussion about me being in a bad mind space because I've been robbed. But anyway, uh, which didn't turn out so well as it turned out. But anyway, um, oh wow, that's a crazy picture. What was I saying? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the first thing, the first thing is that we've got to cover the entire space with these patches. Okay. Now this is of course a criterion that you're used to. Actually, you're not used to it because you don't know what these things are. But back in the day, when you wanted to take a road journey through the United States, you would buy a book. And the book didn't have one big map of the United States, but it had pages, and each page was a small map. And then you took all these maps and you kind of put them together and they formed a big map of the United States. What do we call that book? An atlas. An atlas, exactly. And one of the first rules for Atlas Club is if you take all the pages together, they have to cover the entire thing you're trying to make a map of. Because if you put all the pieces together and then like you're missing New Mexico, that's not a good atlas. Okay? So the first rule here is natural. Like you need to cover the entire space with these patches. You need to leave no, nothing left uncovered. And then um, there's some technical things. These have to be open sets. And one way to make an open set is to draw a circle and say everything in the circle, but not the boundary of the circle. That's the way to make an open set. Um, but the real trick is that when you look at the overlap between two of these, so if we have U1 and U2, then on the intersection, which I will write correctly, um, you have to be able to take the coordinates that you use in U1 and transition them into the coordinates that you use for U2. So there's some additional maps here that I'm not drawing for us, and these are the coordinatization maps where we take points in U1 and we map them to Rn. We take a point in U2 and we map it to Rn. We talked about this in the last lecture. And this is all, this is this idea of taking a point in this space and just mapping it to Rn is called giving it coordinates. That's all you, all you mean. And all we, all we insist on is in the overlap, where a point can be interpreted as being both on U1 and U2, there needs to be a consistent map from this space to this point to that space. And the consistency condition is just that that be a differentiable map in order for this to be a differentiable manifold. Um, so, but that's like a coordinate transformation. So you're just basically asking for differentiable coordinate transformations, so non-singular coordinate transformations. Um, okay, now uh, all that being said, I want to take that and I want to show you that this space is, is a manifold. This is not a trivial proof. Um, well, I mean, to some you know, people a lot smarter than me it's trivial, but to me it's not trivial. Uh, okay, so here's what we're going to do. Um, so we're going to consider this third definition. And what we're going to do is we're going to define our open sets to be the following. We're going to have an open set called UX. And UX is basically all of the points in Rn plus 1 where x is not equal to 0. And you know, we, we, let, let's, do this, um, let's do this for Rp2 defined from uh, R3. Okay, so just so I, I don't have to do an arbitrary number of coordinates, we'll just use three coordinates for R3, and we'll, we'll show that RP2 is a manifold. Okay, so I'm going to start by picking all of the points in R3 where the x value of the coordinate is not zero. You'll see why that's important in a minute. And then similarly, for y and z, okay? And then, um, first of all, if you stare at this long enough and you play around with it, you'll realize that the real projective plane is contained on the union of all of these, okay? I mean, it has to be. If the real projective plane lives in R3, then if you take all of the values all of the points where x is not equal to 0 and y and z take any values including 0, 
and then you separately take these and separately take these, well, you've covered all of it, okay? Um, yeah. What was I going to say? Okay, so we've passed the first rule of, 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 of uh, Manifold Club, which is to make sure that we've covered, or Chirp Club. Um, and now, what we can do is on each of these patches, we're going to define something. So, uh, we have what are called X, Y, and Z here. Um, and X, Y, and Z are what are going to be called the homogeneous coordinates. That is, when we write x, y, and z, x, y, and z all look like they're on the same footing. x looks just as good as y, looks just as good as z. They're all defined in R3 like they're homogeneous. They all look the same, nothing weird. But on each of these, we can define in homogeneous coordinates. Uh, as follows. So what we can do is we can take on ux we can divide all three of these coordinates by x. Okay. Now, why are we allowed to do that on this patch? Because you can't divide by zero. Because x is not zero. x never takes the value zero. Therefore, dividing by x is okay. So if we do that, then the value of x divided by x is, of course, 1, and then we have y over x and z over x. Okay, and then similarly, we can define uh, inhomogeneous coordinates for the rest of the space, for the rest of the patches. Okay. All right. So I'm going to call um, these coordinates a to i on the x patch, a to i on the y patch, and a to i on the z patch, where i just goes one, two, three. Okay, and then all we have to do is check the transition functions on the overlap of these sets. So I'll just pick one overlap because the argument works for any of them. So let's pick the overlap of ux and ui, and then, so if we've got ux and uy, there's the overlap. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a coordinate, and I'm going to write my map going from y to x. So we're going to take a point, so uy has some map, and ux has some map into C3, uh, or no, sorry, R3. We're not doing the complex case yet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a coordinate point here, map it into UY, where I'm looking at the point on the intersection, and then I'm going to take the mapping that comes with UX to map that back into the coordinates for R3. Well, we know how to do that, right? So we basically want a map which takes us from this set of coordinates. That's like the most like passive, trippy alarm. Like. <laughs> Is it going to start noise? making sound? It is making noise? No. It's not. I know, that's what's weird. <laughs> is it going to? Yeah. Is it going to? Like, I don't even know what that alarm is for. I feel bad. Oh. Alert. <laughs> Danger Will Robinson! Danger Will Robinson! Did so we all get an email we didn't read about this? Don't let it Yeah, it's making noise. Emails about. May I have your attention, please? That's me. May I have your attention, please? There has been a fire alarm reported in the building. There has been a fire alarm reported in the building. Please proceed to the stairways and exit the building. Do not use the elevator, but proceed to the stairways. Were you there when this happened? No, but you told me showed up. We had to call the fire department. May I have your attention, please? To come turn off the alarm. There has been a fire alarm reported in the building. Went upstairs to do God knows what, and then came downstairs, and then immediately went right back upstairs. Well, I went upstairs to pack up because I was like, "Well, apparently I'm leaving this building for the evening," and then I, because I didn't know where you guys went. We I went outside because the fire. Well, no, was but I, 
I looked in the lobby and like everyone was gone. And I'm like, where is it left? I don't know. Pack up and go home. I don't know what to do. And then I saw you all outside. Okay, part two. All right, yes. So where were we? We were about to prove that, uh, oh man. Uh, so we're, we're working with RP2. Uh, and we have these patches where we've identified inhomogeneous coordinates. Okay, and we're looking at the overlap. Of course, I've got a marker that sucks. And we're going to look at the overlap of the two patches we would call. <laughs> hey, Leo, you want to come and help me? You want to come help? Come on. Come on. I've got no problem for you, but you can help. So we're going to look at the overlap. <laughs> and uh, what we want is just to check the transition function <laughs> that, um, again, carries us from the coordinates on one of these to the coordinates on the other one. And so really what we're thinking about is what is the transition function which carries me from the coordinates on y to the coordinates on x. Okay. What is the coordinate transformation that does that? Multiply by y divided by x. Exactly, it's multiplication. By y over x. Okay, it obviously turns this into 1, turns this into y over x, and turns it into z over x. Okay? So our transition function f from x to y, if you will, or from y to x, is just multiplication by y over x. And so the question we can ask is, is that a differentiable function? And the only place we might ever have to worry is when x is zero, but is x ever allowed to be zero on this region? No. Okay. Because this region is on ux, and ux is defined as the set of points where x is not allowed to be zero. Okay. And then clearly a similar argument plays through for any other pair of these patches. So you can look at the overlap and it's going to be a similar coordinate change and it's always going to be differentiable. So what we've just done is we've sort of proved that rp2 is a manifold. It has an atlas of charts that covers the whole thing. And on the overlap, we have these differentiable transition functions. OK, so now we're in a good position to define our first non-trivial complex manifold. And it proceeds by analogy to everything that I just said here. OK? So man, I've written on the, the boards in this room in a long time. Yeah, they're not the they're not the better on the um, Okay, so now let's define complex projective space. Uh, from the complex plane in one plus higher complex dimension, where we've removed the origin and quotient with the analog of what we did before. So here we're now quotienting complex coordinates. So z1, z2, etc. is equal to lambda z1, z2, etc. where lambda is any, uh, and I should have said this before, I don't think I said any non-zero real number before, but it should be a non-zero uh, complex number. And then, um, so what I would like to do is something very similar to what we did before for the real projective space, where I proved that it was a manifold, but now I want to prove that this is a complex manifold. Okay? So there's just, it's a little bit different. It's at the very end, and this will come back to the question that Caleb was asking. Um, but we start out in, in pretty much the same way. So um, we know that uh, we can define the charts u alpha to be the uh, 
the chart where the alpha coordinate is not zero. So I've got, you know, n plus one complex coordinates in my original space, and I'm going to define one of the charts as the region where one of those coordinates is not allowed to be zero, but all the other ones can take any value. Okay? Um, and then just like before, uh, it's pretty easy to argue to yourself that the complex projective plane uh, can be uh, completely covered by the union of all of these alphas. Okay, so the real trick is in considering the overlap and demonstrating that the transition functions have the right properties. So I'm going to do this in a slightly more general language, but then I'll come back to, um, well, no, I'll just do it in a, in a general language. Uh, so we're going to define n homogeneous coordinates. And I'm going to call these eta, alpha, mu. And they are going to be defined as all of the coordinates divided by the coordinate that's not allowed to be zero. So that's perfectly analogous to what we did before. Okay, so if we're in the region where x is not allowed to be zero, we define the inhomogeneous coordinates by taking all the coordinates and dividing them by x. So it's just a hoity-toity way of saying that. And then what we can say is, then on an intersection of, say, alpha, u alpha, and u beta, all we have to do is convert from n alpha mu to n beta mu. We convert from the coordinates on one to the coordinates on the other, and that coordinate transformation is our transition function. But this is actually not at all hard to do because we can just write this as z mu over z alpha, or write that as z mu over z beta, z beta over z alpha. But this, of course, is just eta beta mu. Okay, that guy right there is just the new coordinate. Or the, this is, sorry, this is the old coordinates, and then these are the new coordinates that I'm obtaining from the old coordinates. And the transformation is just this guy right here. But my transformation is multiplication by z beta over z alpha, both of which are complex coordinates, not their conjugates. So what sort of transition function is this? It's holomorphic. But like I said, if we can, if we can demonstrate that all of our transition functions on the overlaps of our charts are holomorphic functions, then our manifold is guaranteed to be complex overall. We could also construct the Neuenhaus tensor and prove that it vanishes. Okay. All right, so there is an example of a non-trivial um, complex manifold. Again, to demonstrate that it's actually a complex manifold in full, you have to go and investigate the transition functions and show that they have this, this property of being holomorphic. Um, what's nice about this space, if it's not obvious, um, from our definition of RPN, uh, you know, we had a couple of definitions. If we think about the sphere where we identify antipodal points, then we kind of capture you know, sort of a hemisphere, but it's kind of weird because you don't get fully the edge and everything. Um, but hopefully from this construction, you can, you can see that these are compact spaces. They don't go out to infinity. Like it's literally a, a set of points that you can kind of put your arms around, okay? Compact spaces are very important for a lot of reasons, but in particular for applications in string theory, where you're trying to argue these are the form of the small extra dimensions that are required, you certainly want the spaces to be compact because infinite extra dimensions are a little harder to explain. You can do it, but it's a little harder. So the natural assumption is to say they're smaller. Also, in, in mathematics, it turns out that compact spaces tend to enjoy much more interesting topological 
uh, non-triviality than non-compact spaces. A lot of non-compact spaces, uh, um, not all of them, but a lot of them are uh, topologically trivial. So a lot, of, a lot of times people restrict themselves to compact spaces. Now, um, so uh, it, by extension, uh, the complex version of the plane, the complex, sorry, the complex projective space is also a compact, a compact example of a complex manifold. Um, but that's only a starting point. One of the really nice things about having a space that satisfies the properties of, say, being a manifold or being a complex space is that once you have one, a lot of times you can automatically build others as subspaces of them. So, you know, a natural example is, and I'm going to proceed by analogy, if we have R3, okay, you could go through the proof, but it's pretty trivial to prove that this base R3 is a manifold, okay? But then what you can do is you can consider the subspace in that, which is S2. Okay. And S2, by virtue of the fact that it's a subspace of R3, inherits some interesting properties. Um, and defined in the right way, S2 itself is also a manifold. Now, to define S2 as a subspace of R3, and people in GR should remember this because we talked about this in lecture last time, I think. Or maybe we talked about it in this class. Shit, I can't remember. I'm getting all confused now. Uh, how can you specify S2 in R3? Did I talk about this in GR? No. You talked about it here. I talked about it here? Oh, okay. So how can I die? Wow, really? I don't even remember the context. How can I identify a subspace? So how can I identify the sphere S2 in terms of coordinates x, y, and z? Function of x, y, and z equals zero. Yeah, so a function of x, y, and z equals zero. So in particular, we know that x squared plus y squared plus. Just, just check and make sure you have your functions here. We know that the, the sphere is the set of coordinate values x, y, z that satisfies the equation of sphere. But just by moving that to the other side, that means that that is zero. And so this is some function of x, y, and z, which vanishes. And in general, if I provide you with a function of the coordinates in the original space, which vanishes, then I can use that to define a subspace, okay? It turns out that starting with complex projective space, you can do a similar thing. You can write down functions of the coordinates, okay? And you don't have to write down just one. You can write down several. Every time you write down an equation, that basically reduces the dimensionality of the space by one. So if I write down one equation, I go from R3 to S2. If I wrote down another equation that's compatible with this, I could go from S2 to a one-dimensional space. For example, I could write another equation, uh, uh, g of x, y, and z equals um, z equals zero. That's certainly a function of x, y, and z. It's a pretty trivial one. But if I combine this function with this function, then I notice that I'm actually sitting in S1 in the xy plane. Okay, so the more functions you provide, the smaller the sub-manifold sub tends to be. And so what we can do is we can take complex projective space <coughs> defined in this way that we defined it, <coughs> and we can, for example, consider uh, z1 to the fifth plus z2 to the fifth plus z3 to the fifth. Uh, let's take this to be cp4 plus z4 to the fifth plus z5 to the fifth. Uh, remember, cp4 is defined starting from c5, and then you make the identification. So there are five coordinates on, on the space in which, in which this is defined. And if I set those equal to zero, then this actually defines a subspace of CP4 called the Fermat Quantic. Okay. And the, the thing I want to stress to you, which I, I, I think I talked about like the last time 
or, or like several semesters ago when I talked about topology and, and, and physics and so forth is um, a lot of times when you set up topological tools, you, you know, you work with these really low dimension spaces that are easy to visualize, like an S2, like, you know, almost every topological definition you start by applying it to S2 because S2 is topologically non-trivial, but it's something you can draw and it's something we can all wrap our head around. And so we talk about, you know, covering it with charts and, and you know, talking about overlaps and all this stuff. But the truth is, is most spaces are not defined through pictures. Like we wish we could, but you know, most spaces get way beyond three dimensions. You know, four dimension spaces, you can't even start to draw. Start getting into five dimensional complex spaces, you're screwed, okay? Most spaces you find are actually defined through some kind of algebraic relations. So when you're, when you're working with the tools of topology, you're not always drawing these nice pictures, you're actually working in terms of these mathematical definitions. And so that's why you have to have this more formulaic way of defining all of these things. And, it, and, and so when you follow through topological arguments uh, for real spaces of interest, actually applying the tools looks a little bit different, okay? It looks a little bit more like what we did with the inhomogeneous coordinates, right? We weren't drawing pictures, we were just doing this, you know, writing down some coordinates. We could have done that for, you know, as many coordinates as we wanted, and then we looked at the transition functions and so forth, okay? Um, but anyway, uh, why do I pick on this particular example? This is a Calabial threefold. So the Fermat Quintic in CP4 is one example of a Calabial space. It's by no means the only example. It's probably one of the most studied. Um, but just to give you an idea of mathematically how you would define a Calabial, there's a definition of a Calabial. Now, we're not done. We're not by, by a remote stretch. Um, the, the use of Calabials is that they have some very, very powerful and important properties, both in pure math and in applications in string theory and physics in general. And so what we're going to do, probably next time, because it's already 7.20, but just to kind of finish this at a point, what we're going to do is we are going to explore sort of the defining properties of Calabials. We already know they're complex spaces. We already kind of know that that's going to play an important role. But we're going to find that in addition to being complex, they are Kähler, which I was ready to define for you and talk about today, but we're going to talk about it next time. Uh, they are Kähler manifolds. Uh, they happen to be Ritchie flat. They have vanishing first term character. And SU3 holonomy. Some of these statements are interchangeable. Um, so we're going to kind of go through what all of these things mean over the next couple of times of meeting. Um, and then in the end, we'll talk about why these properties are actually important. So first of all, I want to, I want to kind of give you a little historical lesson. Uh, the, so Calabi conjectured sort of an important relationship in these spaces in 1955 way before string theory was ever even on the horizon, okay? Um, Yao proved Calabi's conjecture about 20 years later, about the time that string theory was born. But string theory in its infancy didn't really appreciate the need for Calabi-Yaws and so forth. So the notion of calabi out manifolds and a lot of their properties were sort of sorted out by mathematicians before string theorists ever really got interested in them. And then string theory came along, and string theory said, we got these extra dimensions, we've got supersymmetry, we've got to kind of sort that out. And it ended up that Calabi-Alice became the magic space to consider. And so string theorists started working on calabi a lot. And then string theorists started discovering things about strings on calabi that mathematicians couldn't prove. In particular, they discovered this really interesting property called mirror symmetry where you could take a string theory on one Calabial and a different string theory on a different Calabial, and the, lo the resulting physics was actually indistinguishable. So there was in some sense a symmetry between this picture and this picture, even though they were completely different starting points, and mathematicians couldn't prove it. So there is sort of this kind of 
really interesting back and forth between the math and the physics community in terms of, you know, sort of discovering these spaces and some of their important properties and physicists coming along and working with them because they need to, but then discovering even more properties and giving it back to the mathematicians and now mathematicians are working on collabials all hot and heavy trying to explore these, uh, these nice mirror symmetry duality properties. But we'll get to that in time. Uh, so, but we're going to finish there so we can go to our GR work. All right, sorry about the fire alarm. Somebody was probably trying to make nitrogen ice cream. And, uh, dipping dots. Dipping dots, yeah. Um, that's awesome. So, the lesson is if I have six pages of notes, I'm going to get through three of them. Yeah. Um, but that, I'm never going to show up with just three pages of notes for